pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel with so many fantastic authors. I've got a lot of reading to do, it seems. Um, and it's a curious thing, um, writing, writing a book, because you become associated with it and then people expect you to keep writing about the same thing. So when I told people that my next book was gonna be about the Arctic, um, having written several books on Africa, there were a few raised eyebrows and one person said, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, but the connection between the Arctic and the tropics is actually a lot uh, stronger than you might think, um, because of course, climate breakdown affects the sensitive parts of the planet first. So having finished that book, City of Thorns, and understanding more and more as, it, as the project went on, the extent to which the conflict and, and the displacement that I was witnessing was driven by climate change. I began looking for other examples, other parts of the world where we could see this process in action, where we could see uh, climate breakdown perhaps as history already, and we could perhaps catch a glimpse of the future that awaits the rest of us. So I began uh, digging around and doing research and came across this very arresting image of the trees in the forest moving north towards the pole. Uh, I discovered that the forest was on the move um, and the trees were turning the white Arctic green. They shouldn't be on the move. That's, that's not supposed to happen. Um, and this sinister fact has huge consequences, as I was to find out, for all life on Earth. Could we have the first slide, the map, please? So hopefully you can see now this bird's eye view of the North Pole, and you can see this dark gray, if uh, I'm afraid publishers can't afford color pictures these days, but, um, the dark gray is the green halo at the top of the world, um, which is the boreal forest. It contains a third of all the trees on earth, more than the Amazon, the boreal is truly the lung of the world. And this is its present position. This is the, the, the top line towards the pole is the top is the present position of the tree line. But where once upon a time it was moving at centimeters um, a year towards the North Pole. Now it's galloping forward at 20, 30, 40, 50 meters um, at a time. So you might think um, more trees um, is a good thing, right? More carbon dioxide, more, um, more uh, oxygen. But while the trees might be having a ball in some parts of, uh, of the Arctic, for all those other species, including humans that have evolved to rely on things as they are, um, that's not so great. So as you'll see, um, you can't quite see here, but um, the top of the, the, the tree line in, in Europe does a, does a uh, slice across the top of Scandinavia um, in Finnmark in Northern Norway. And that was where I went to witness what was happening to, to the birch. And I spoke to a woman called Berit Utsi, who is the secretary of the Sami Reindeer Herders Association in Norway. And she lives in a house uh, surrounded by birch trees in a young forest. But she told me that when she was growing up, the forest, um, the, the house was in the middle of the tundra. Um, and what's happening for the Sami is a disaster because for 10,000 years, they have evolved, um, co-evolved with the reindeer, to follow the reindeer migrating across the tundra. Now, the reindeer guide, find their way through their own sense of direction, through the stars, through their awareness of the magnetic field, and also through their knowledge of the landscape. But the landscape is changing and is becoming unrecognizable. So in this second picture, which hopefully Daisy can show you, um, is the view from the um, from Berit's house, where you see the tundra, this uh, once upon a time, this white uh, pristine plain across which the, the reindeer would navigate is now completely overrun by these stubby Krumholtz birch trees. And the reindeer get confused, they can't find their way. Um, and of course, the trees catch more snow, the snow insulates the ground, it melts the permafrost, the, the roots of the birch trees that encourage microbial activity, which melts the permafrost more and so on. So you get 
the whole of the of the soil is boiling up with vegetation and it's completely trashing their way of life so for the sami the birch was once their handmaiden it was what they used for cooking utensils for sleds for for tent poles all kinds of things but now it's become an enemy and Berit, when i interviewed her was, was suffering from depression she said the trees have become too much and now she's training to be a teacher the thing about ecosystems is that they're hugely complex and one of the key things i learned on this uh, on this journey was was how complex and differentiated they, they are so whilst in scandinavia the birch trees are on the march in russia a bit further along uh, where i went it's a completely different story the boreal forest is actually shrinking um, and the reason for that is that in Russia, the forest is largely made up of larch and larch has co-evolved with the permafrost. So when the changes happen to the permafrost, they also affect the range of the larch. Now, larch trees, this is, I learned so much on this book and through, through this research and only some of it's in the book, but hopefully you'll learn something too if you, if you read it. But the, the larch trees breathe through their roots as well as through their needles. So in intact permafrost, that's great because uh, there's lots of air pockets. But when the permafrost melts, the soil becomes waterlogged and the larch effectively drown. So what's happening in Russia is that band of boreal forest at the top that is shrinking because the larch trees are drowning and the, and the tundra is becoming waterlogged. And in the south, these huge wildfires are burning up increasing the step from Mongolia and Kazakhstan. So hundreds and thousands of, of square kilometers of forest are being destroyed and the forest is actually shrinking like this. It's, it's a challenge um, to maps um, and it's hard to grasp what's going on. There's enormous changes happening year on year. Things are shifting all the time. It's no wonder that the maps are out of date, but it's not just a challenge to maps. It's also a challenge to our own imagination to how we think of the planet and i mean to some extent the planet we think we live on is no more it's already something else um, so this third slide which i'd like to show you is a place called arimas and that means forest island these are the most northerly trees on the planet they're 72 degrees north and it took us uh, several days of driving in this awful huge arctic truck uh, with three very disagreeable russian men uh, and five liters of vodka and a couple of rifles um, to get to this point they really didn't want to go they couldn't see the see the point of it if we'd have carried on driving across uh, the arctic ocean which is just beyond the, the frame of the photo we would have reached the north pole um, in, a, in about another day but I wanted to go there because these are, this is the climax of the tree line. This is the most northerly trees in the world um, to see what was happening. But of course, when we got there, um, we, we checked the measurements and, and had, had had a brief from the scientists and discovered that of course, these trees haven't moved for 20 years. They haven't even grown for 20 years because although the temperature has gone up by an average of 20 degrees, it's now minus 40 instead of minus 60. So it's not enough to make an appreciable change to the tree line. So the, the, the Russian guys who, my translator and the driver who, who came with me were delighted. They said, you see, this is nonsense. The, 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 your, your idea about the trees moving is, is not true. Um, so on one level, it, it's hard to notice. But then the next day we went to see the ornithologist of the National Park of Arimas who spends his summers observing birds. And he said, he described to us how he had begun to see forest species from the Black Sea, north of the tree line at Arimas on the shore of the Arctic Ocean. Birds like hoopoos and ravens and uh, certain kinds of finches. And he was utterly shocked. So we have to, catch up our brain in a way is playing catch up just like the trees are playing catch up with how we think um the, the, what we think of the, the planet is um and we went then to see to stay with the dolgan nomads similar uh, relate, um, relatives of the of the sami once upon a time and they uh live on the tundra near arimas and they had noticed new kinds of grasses new butterflies new insects 
And the other thing they had spotted was bubbles in the ice. So we were staying in, uh, uh, in a canvas tent at minus 45, and all of our water came from a nearby lake. We had to go and dig it out with an ice pick and then melt it on the fire. And when it was my turn to do this job, I looked down on this kind of what looked like glass, really, kind of glass, black glass surface, and you look down into the depths. And there, suspended in the ice, you see these tiny little bubbles, these very beautiful, exquisite things. They look like pearls. Um, and uh, when we took some of those shards back into the tent, the Dolgans took great delight in lighting them. And of course, they give this little pop because it's methane. And they thought this was hilarious, but there's nothing funny about methane. And that for me was, a, was a, a revelation to think that we were standing on this enormous territory, Siberia, two million square miles, um, and it's half of the, the boreal forest. 15% of the world's surface is permafrost, and most of it is projected to be gone by the end of this century. We've got no idea how much carbon dioxide and methane is in that permafrost, and we've got no idea how fast it's being released either. And methane is not accounted for in IPCC models because it's too hard um, to model. So what I learned on this journey was how much we don't know. There is the wonder of this incredible forest and these geophysical systems which are purifying the air and driving the winds and the rain and the climate of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but there are processes underway which are unstoppable warming is happening uh, and there's very little we can do about it. We can slow it down by all means, but uh, uh, two degrees of warming is, in, is committed already. What that means is that we are on the brink of a new epoch in the life of our planet. And that means that my children are among the last generation to be born who will know what seasonal climates are, what uh, the seasonal cycles are, what familiar species and human culture that rests on the stability of, of the climate. And that's really tough. Um, and that's why eco-anxiety and grief and you know, all of these things are, are top of the agenda. But at the same time, accepting the, the status quo is unsustainable is also an opportunity. It, it's not the end of human life as we know it, but it does mean we have to adapt and we have to evolve. And the other lesson of the forest is that nature is a system as I'm sure you know, the, the tree needs the fungi, the flower needs the pollinator, the tree is firing aerosols into the atmosphere to create its own climate, to, to seed the, the, the clouds, to bring rain and so on. Um, this uh, system is, is how things evolve. The tree line is this dynamic um, team effort at making sense of new circumstances. Um, all evolution is co-evolution. The idea of, 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 of natural selection needs a, a lot of refining. Um, we've always needed other species. And now the critical thing is that some of us, uh, some of them rather, will need us too. The boreal forest is going to be fine because these trees, these hardy species like the birch and the pine and the larch, they've been riding the tides of ice up and down for millennia because every time the ice age comes, it sends a sheet of ice down and then the trees follow hot on its heels. So actually, if you look at a time-lapse image of the globe, you'll see the tree line rising and falling like breath every 100,000 years, or at least that's how it's been for the last 3 million. The next ice age is, is postponed. The question is, who's going to live in that forest? So these trees, climate change is their core business. They've been, they've been doing this for a long time. But who's going to live in that forest? And at this moment, we are a bit like Noah and his ark. We can choose some of what survives the sixth extinction, including ourselves. So the question we have to ask is, do we want to be part of that assemblage of species which will co-evolve to survive the coming uncertainty? And if we do, there's a really demanding task ahead, which means we've got to rejoin nature, we've got to regain our place in nature, we've got to re-entangle ourselves with other species, we've got to get to know them again. We need to understand their names, their ways and their needs. We cannot indulge any longer this idea of separation between 
between humans and nature. How it goes for other species will be how it goes for future generations, uh, this century and after. Um, and if you're in any doubt, you just need to look at your thumbs because we evolved uh, in the trees. Humans have always been creatures of the forest. Thank you.